Good Girl Confessional Podcast and WB40 Women Beyond 40 would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which this podcast and our platform is recorded and researched, the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nations. We pay our deepest respects to their elders, past and present, and we pay homage to their ancient culture of storytelling. Hello and welcome back to the Good Girl Confessional Podcast. I'm your host, Sandy Lowrys, and the Good Girl Confessional Podcast is proudly the podcast of WB40, Women Beyond 40, a platform for women in midlife and beyond, um, where we believe that every woman has a story and every story matters. If this is your first time joining us, a huge welcome. But if you are returning, a massive thank you for your continued and incredible support. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I am thrilled today to be chatting with a very special guest. Her name is Barbara Sumner. She's an esteemed New Zealand filmmaker and author, and you may know Barbara from her incredible memoir called Tree of Strangers, where she explored um, her story of adoption. Today, however, we are talking about her incredible new book, her first time writing a novel, and it is called The Gallows Bird. If you're watching along on YouTube, um, you'll see it here. It's an incredible book. Now, as we all know, um, women are often eradicated from history, like it just happens. And what Barbara has written here is quite an incredible journey. Um, It is fiction, but really it encompasses the stories, I'm sure, of what many women in the 1830s went through. This story is based on a character by the name of Birdie, who um, is living in a fairly brutal London in 1830s. And her journey from going from London, being shipped out here um, for a life of servitude here in Australia as a convict, um, she describes it as an illicit love, a deadly crime and a woman's ideas behind her station. It is a gripping novel. It is fantastic. It's beautifully written. Now, not only is Barbara an accomplished author um, and filmmaker, but she's also completing a PhD um, and she will be embarking on a prestigious Michael King residency. She is living proof that you are never, ever too old to follow your dreams and your passions. Um, If there's something you've always wanted to put your hand to, maybe give it a try. Please give a very warm welcome to the confessional, Barbara Sumner. Hey, how about a podcast about all the music that got us hooked up, knocked up and broken up? If that got you humming a hit from the 70s and 80s, then have we got a show for you. I'm Jo Pipers, and when Sandy's not in the confessional talking to awesome chicks, she's driving a Sandman over to my place and co-hosting Alex the Seal with me and Molly, a podcast about music nostalgia. Just search for Alex the Seal on your podcast app. Hello and welcome to the Good Girl Confessional, Barbara. How are you today? I am Great and really happy to be here with you, Sandy. I'm very, very happy that you've joined me. And I will say, like, thanks for joining me all the way from New Zealand. Love that. Uh, I'm here in Melbourne, obviously, in Australia. And um, I'm really thrilled. So we've just been chatting before we even hit the record button because I think you're fabulous. We could have been talking for an hour, I think. (laughs) Easily. (laughs) Um, Barbara, thanks so much for joining us today. I am really excited to be chatting with you. And first of all, I want to say congratulations on uh, your beautiful new book. The Gallows Bird. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. You're you're an amazing writer. I mean, there's that's not a secret. Um, and I can't wait to delve into this beautiful book. But before we do, I really wanted to um, introduce you a bit more. I think to our listeners, who in case they've not uh, read any of your work, and your first book was an extraordinary memoir called uh, Tree of Strangers. And I wanted to delve into that and ask if you could tell us a little bit about your hard-won wisdom, your backstory, and how the memoir came about. Oh, thank you. Um, The memoir was a very difficult um, process. I started it, I went into some serious therapy at 55 where I was not really doing great in my life. And that's the, the memoir came out of that. But um, as an adult adopted as an infant, I wanted to write about that experience, but not just about the 
story of my adoption and life, but put it within a structure that showed um, how uh, how other people feel about it, the some of the psychological, the physiological effects, the legal effects of adoption, and I wanted to bring that into a more um, I wanted to bring together a whole lot of facts. And uh, the memoir came out of that, and obviously being in the, in the therapy helped. And it um, it came out on my um, 60th birthday, and it's done it's done really well. Um, it's not often that we hear the really unvarnished um, voices of adopted people. We really have a cultural script of advantage and gratitude and rescue that comes with adoption. And it's often quite difficult to speak against that narrative. Yeah, right. And, you know, that is powerful. I think what's powerful is that, yeah, there's in that, I guess that you've really like, you exposed yourself, but really what you did was tell the truth that it's not, as you say, all these, a lot of stories of adoption are not actually, if you scratch the surface, they're not about gratitude and life isn't always easy for those who find themselves adopted. Well, that's true. I mean, one of the things we like as a society are reunion stories. And I like to call that reunion porn because it really is something that, uh, you know, it's a bleed it leads kind of um, approach. So we have all these shows around families reuniting and we never look at what happens next. So it's an incredibly difficult thing to reunite with a family that you've been completely disconnected from, that you have no legal right to belong to, and you have no shared history of cultural experience. So while you may share DNA, the cultural parts that make up our lives are huge. So you're trying to put very disparate groups of people together and say that, you know, oh, we're brother and sister or, you know, relatives in these ways. And it's a it's a fraught area. Mm. Yeah, right. It's um and of course we're not we are in no way saying that all stories of adoption, you know, are difficult and either. But absolutely not. No. Yeah. But this is something obviously I think I'm really fascinated um that your story, your truth, I think has led you then to we were talking about this very briefly before, but I'm fascinated by how how did your truth, your story and your life and your life experiences help to form characters that you write about. So you've here we go. Welcome to the new book. You have written um this extraordinary novel and in it you are talking about the stories of convict women that are quite often not told or they're told from a male perspective and I'm wondering how a you came to write the book but b how much of your hard one wisdom how much of your truth forms the characters that you write about oh difficult questions um in terms of how my own experience and uh, my own wisdom, hard won wisdom, as you call it, um, I think that all of us, all women, you know, uh, we struggle with we struggle with the same things. Obviously, we express them differently. And when I came to start thinking about the the convict women, I thought, well, they're just us in a different time and place. But the desire to survive, to succeed, to make families, to to feel secure, to create environments that are fulfilling, uh, to not starve, you know, these are all these are all the things that all of us understand in some way. And so being able to try and uh, find the inner lives of those characters was not so difficult. Um, what I think is interesting is, and how my experience plays into it, is that I, I was my my but my entire family is British, but my mother was pregnant when she came to New Zealand, 
So I'm not, I'm a first generation New Zealander. And I was deeply fascinated from, for many years with convict, with female convicts into Australia. I could never figure it out. Why was I so interested in that? And having been completely disconnected from um, any biological family, there was no basis for me to even begin to understand that. And I wrote it, I began writing it, you know, over 25 years ago, just dipping in and out as I was doing other things in my life. And only about three years ago, through DNA um, and a cousin who put together a family tree, I discovered that I had three convict ancestors. And then, in fact, and one of them, uh, a woman, some of her parts of her story were really similar to um, my character, Birdie, in this book. Now, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know whether my ancestors were trying to, you know, speak to me through it or bring me back into the family fold that I had been taken away from. So they would drop these little bits of story into my life. But um, it was certainly a subject I could not put down. Um, and boy, have you created like an extraordinary tale here. It's beautiful, beautifully written. Um, there is a darkness in this book and we, you know, I touched on that sort of a little bit earlier. Um, where do you think, I should say too, because we keep, I keep holding it up, but I haven't even said, it's called The Gallows Bird. Now, even the title is, there's a darkness to this title, which I loved. How did you come up with the title? And maybe, I, you know, can you explain to everyone what that actually means? Well, if a woman had committed a crime in, in England and, the, and she was sentenced to hang, she was known as either the gallows bird or the gallows bride sometimes as well. But my character's name was always going to be Hannah Bird, known as Birdie, right from the very beginning. And then another family a connection not, this time on the other side of my family, I discovered that my ancestor was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and his name was John Bird Sumner, and his mother was Hannah Bird, known as Birdie. And that, again, about four years ago, I discovered that side of my family. So, obviously, the Archbishop of Canterbury's mother did not was not a convict, but so the same name, but he also sent hundreds of women, hundreds of people, men as well, to Australia as convicts. So again, the strange connection. Um, and one of the things that I found really interesting in my, you know, because I love research so much, um, you know, I've discovered how women had if they committed a small crime, they stole an apple or a piece of bread or picked a you know silk handkerchief from someone's pocket, they might and they got caught, they would go to jail for a week or two weeks where they would pick oakum or do do some heavy duty you know menial task. And almost overnight the law changed because suddenly there were you know thousands of men in Australia and no women that were available to them. And they were acquiring what was known as the Englishman's disease, which we can figure out means that they were taking their comfort with each other. And so almost overnight, an entire class of women defined by poverty were criminalized for the smallest crimes. And instead of going to jail for two weeks, they were sent for a minimum of seven years. Wow. Um, and I think you know, it, it's, it's actually really disturbing to think that these women were not only sentenced to seven years, but ripped away from their families, their lives, their entire culture and shipped off to Australia to a land they didn't, they knew nothing about, literally nothing about, which was, um, must have been so terrifying. I try and imagine myself what it must have been like for these women on that on those ships, you know, even coming over. The passage yeah. to get from England to Australia was fraught. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, that's, you know, and it, it's been well written about, I think. But, you know, the, the illness and the sickness and the, you know, the despair they must have been feeling to then come over here um, 
criminalised and then basically auctioned off, if you like, to the highest bidder. Yeah, of course. They had to. Well, there was an interesting situation where, um, for men, Australia, the country, was the prison. But for women who and the women once they arrived, they had to be they had to be married off, um, auctioned off, married off, sold by the sailors uh, to then to enable them to be free within the country in the same way the men were. So that they were indentured to their uh, new husbands. The women that failed in that uh, were too old, too unattractive, pregnant, whatever. They were then sent to the female factory in Parramatta. So that became a, f- a prison within a prison. And just going back to what you were saying about the unknownness of it, when you think that people lived with it, usually went no more than half a day's walk from where they were born or where they lived particularly people that were, you know, the lower classes. So they would, they many had never seen the sea. Many had never seen the Thames, the river. The idea of the sea was a, was a you know, a mythical, was quite mythical. So you think that you've taken from this incredible world where you are woven into the buildings and the people and the, you know, the noise and the smell and the, the intrigue of those worlds those very tightly woven worlds, and you're taken to somewhere that is utterly unknown. It's like we don't live in that. We live now where there is not very much that is unknown that we can, you know, I'm looking today, I was looking at a travel blog to Bolivia and thinking, wow, that would be interesting. Such ideas were unthinkable. So what was Australia? They had no idea. Nobody knew what that was. And so the idea of the of the ocean and being in this tiny ship in the middle of this vastness when they've only ever had the most tightly woven lives, I think we can all easily imagine how extreme that must have been. Yeah, just terrifying, right? Terrifying. And you're amongst a whole lot of people that generally you wouldn't know either. That's the other thing, right? So um, I I think I am um, intrigued always by the stories of women and I'm intrigued by the bonds that women make and how I always say, you know, when women come together and yeah. tell their inner truth, like magic starts to happen, I absolutely love through your writing and through these extraordinary characters that you beautifully show that, that in the midst of, I guess, trauma and chaos and these terrible things going on around them, that women can form extraordinary bonds and alliances, if you like. Yeah. I mean, I think we've all experienced times where we've been kept alive by our women friends and very much Birdie and her, the women that she finds herself with. I mean, they're not all, they don't all make great friends, but they, um, obviously there's, you know, some betrayal, which I, I always think is the meat of, of good, of good drama, good writing. There's a bit of betrayal in there. But as Lizzie says, you know, we're here to get to the other side and they have to do whatever it takes. And I know what that feels like to do whatever it takes to survive. And I think we all do. And, you know, I have, you can't see this here, but I have another screen on my desk and it's propped up. It's a large screen and it's propped up by Robert Hughes' The Fatal Shore, which is the famous Australian book. And I keep it there to remind myself that our stories matter because within The Fatal Shore, they don't matter. I mean, it's a great piece of writing. It was pivotal in me beginning to understand the convict error, I guess, but we're invisible or we are utilities. And that's what I wanted to change because, you know, once once the women had got to Australia, survived, m- married so that they could have some form of freedom, they founded the country. The real work was done by the women. They did the industry. They started the soap factories or the, you know, they made the cloth at the female factory that was then sent back to England and used. Um, 
they broke down the flax. They did the all those things that were fundamental to the beginning of of such a vibrant society. And and incredibly, like all of these women who came and they, as you say, um, they were doing some extraordinary things. They just were, and I mean, they didn't really have a choice either. Let's face it; it's not like you know you're thrown into this situation. Um, but their stories, a lot of these women, their stories have not been told. They've not been shared unless it's told by, you know, they were documented by men perhaps. Um, but a lot of these women came here and, as you say, they've been forgotten or their story, they were never even known, let alone forgotten. They just become names on a on a ship's <laughs> log. Um, what happened, you know, and, and it, I find it so fascinating and obviously you found it fascinating enough that you thought, I'm going to tell some of these stories. I think. Um, it's so important. And I think, I wonder how many people now we touched before on a lot of people now doing their DNA, you know, getting their DNA tested, they're on ancestry.com or other places. And a lot of people are finding out their history because of this, this new technology, because it's now like so mainstream and we have access to it, but we're finding, you know, a lot of people are finding in their family trees, these people. So you go, okay, that's a name my great, great, great grandmother, for example, or whatever it may be, then you go, but who was she? Yeah. Yeah. Who was she is the question. And you know what I'm always saying is a history without women is no history at all. And, you know, we think of ourselves, particularly as we age, as becoming increasingly invisible. But I think the real invisibility lies behind us in that, you know, how do you how do you really feel like you belong in society when the the experiences of being women is not are not the common stories that we hear we do hear men's version of history men's version of war men's version of survival and that's that's great it's needed but it's it's not how women make their way through the world you know you think about the women on the ship they had to do certain things to survive. They had to allow themselves to be taken by the sailors as their as wives. Most of them, many of them were married already. Many of them had children that were left behind. They um and yet they had to do these unthinkable things to survive. And you know, we don't have to do that, but but uh, but there are parts, you know, pockets in our society today where that is still happening, where women are being trafficked, and you can see these women as having been trafficked. A hundred percent, and I think that that was the the thing that really struck me was exactly that. Um, this theme of you know the underlying truth of fem- you know, of women being trafficked. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was, we were chatting before earlier, actually, and I was saying about Margaret Atwood and the, the extraordinary thing that she always says, which is that she never writes about her female characters in situations that have not happened to at least one woman in real life. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I love in this book that what you've done is actually show that female truth that that women went through all of these kind of extraordinary things. And they, because these stories are generally not told um, or, you know, we only hear, as you say, the male history, because these stories are often not told, it's those things that you touched on that are so devastating when you do think about them, when you're forced to think about them, which was imagine leaving your children behind, your husband behind or your love or your parents or your your siblings or whomever it may be. You've literally left your entire life behind and you, there's no way to send a letter. There's no way to, you know what I mean? Like it's not the internet. We don't have email and we don't, yeah. Yeah. What is, how, what is communication in a time, in that time where everything you know has gone from you? It's, um, and it it is unthinkable, and yet it's also i the other thing I think of I guess is that the women were too busy to write to write their stories down one particularly once they got there you know they're building an entire new country and those that could actually read or write, and that wasn't everyone so often the the stories, particularly ship stories, are written by surgeons and captains 
and those who are, have the control over the women. And okay, I don't know for sure that the surgeon on any particular ship carrying women to Australia at that time was abusive to the women. But I know of other situations where in, at that time where that sort of thing was happening. So it's like Margaret Atwood says, it, these things have happened and do happen to women. And so it is, it is appropriate that we, that we imagine them, that we imag- that we bring them to life through our imaginations. Because otherwise we don't, we come from nowhere, all of us. It's like we don't have a, a female history, a, you know, a general female history. That's what I wanted to do was bring a generalized female history into our today lives. Yeah, um, and and so important that you have as well. So, um, tell me about Verdi. So we know, you know, that you conceptualized her name, and it was always going to be that. But how did you actually, I guess, form her? How did she become real in your imagination, and then down on paper? I, I mean, it's kind of, it's sort of seems sort of ridiculous to say, but it's like she formed herself. And I mean, there's always this debate amongst writers. Do you, do you fly by, you know, are you a pantser or a planner? You know, do you fly by the seat of your pants or do you plan? I'm a pantser. I, I get in there, I start and I write quite chronologically and I just start and the story grows and develops as, as I'm, as the, it's, it's a combination between characters revealing themselves and the, the research. So Birdie is an under-laundry maid, as we know. So there was a lot of, I enjoyed so much the research into laundry techniques, um, you know, in the 1830s. What was it like to run a laundry? And there's information, we can, you know, we find things about that. And so those kind of structures, what was the structure of a house at that time, a, you know, a, a manor house, not a big fancy castle, but a manor house in London that is slowly being, um, that has been in the countryside and is being taken over by the expanse of the expanding city. So there's those, those kind of things. And then, you know, the idea of the corridors. I love, part, one of the things I love in the first part of the book is that the servants observe the 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 masters through the little pie holes pinholes in the co- internal corridors that are dark and you know run through the house and are full of mice and so there's these worlds what this world of people watching this other world of people and that i mean that's what we do as writers we are really we're just hidden in the corridor watching <laughs> <laughs> i i actually love that i think that that's really that's beautiful, actually. Um, tell us really about, so your writing journey. Tell us about your writing journey. Well, this particular book, as I say, I started it many years ago and I would dip in and out of it all the time. Um, I did other things. I made some documentaries. Um, you know, I worked as a journalist and a columnist, those kinds of things. Um, in fact, I even hmm, did. I have, yeah, I started it, and then I had another child. So that's thirty years ago. Um, so it's a little longer than I like to say. I don't normally take that long to write, but over time it grew, and then I was in a position where I was able to uh, maybe five years ago really dedicate myself to it. So I took it was a it was much smaller and it was a much shorter you know piece, and I took it and just was able to bury myself within it for about two years where I really wrote it intensely. And I'm quite methodical. You know, I get up and I do my morning routine and I sit down and I write. And I don't I don't write to a number, but I do write to um until I can't, until my brain stops working and then I stop. Um so yeah, I guess I have, you know, I'm a, like a short distance runner. I have bursts, really intense bursts, and then stop. And the amount of research, I can't even begin to imagine how much research you did to go into this book. Um, and I learned a lot, like about, you know, the factory, and I, I learned 
what life would have been like, you know, for women in Parramatta, like landing in Sydney at that time. Um, yeah. How, like, did you fall down rabbit holes? Did you find yourself, or was it difficult, I guess is what I'm trying to, to, to ask here, how difficult was the research process in this and or did you just find troves of information? Um, in terms of the women's stories themselves, there isn't a lot. There are diaries, and there are some there are some you know publications, but none of them are, are recent. Obviously, the diaries are not recent. <laughs> but you know, like if anyone really people are really interested in the subject, and you can get to Parramatta, the female factory is still there. It's a, a volunteer-run museum. It's not in great shape. Uh, they have one library research room, and the volunteers that work there are incredible. And it's so worth understanding, you know, this place is still there. You can stand in the middle of it and get a real sense of of what it was. And, I mean, to me, that was, I went and spent time there, and that was just golden, being able to walk around and smell it and feel it and look at the windows and think about the courtyard and the the upstairs, you know, the attic area and all of that. So this sort of history is sitting there, but it, it we don't have enough context a lot of the time to understand what that place was like. You know, at the back there's a the stream runs past it and it has these big flat stones that the women would wash clothes on. Things like that. And you go, oh, that's how they did that. And I I love those those types of things, how the river moved, the, the smell of the trees, the, the, you know, the cacophony of bird life. These things are, you know, you don't just have to have historical literature to understand them. And, of course, they're impacting on the characters because they're in the middle of it. And it is a very intense and vibrant world and utterly different from what they've come from. Such a different vibrancy. Yeah, gosh. Um, and such a tough life. I mean, we can't, you know, you can't, it's not a life you can romanticize, <laughs> you know, you can't go, oh, it was so lovely. And then this happened. And then, you know, a tough, tough life. And yeah. women, as we all know, are made of tough stuff because we have to be, we have to be, right? Attitudes. Attitude. Look at the attitude of Lizzie, one of the characters. Mm. I love her attitude. She was so powerful for me in that she just kept going. I mean, obviously, we know some of you've read it, so you know some of the things that happened to her, but her attitude is so fabulous. I really want to be more like Lizzie in my, you know, in my daily um, uh, making the most of what you have. If you can't, if you can't choose it, if you can't choose your, you know, if, if you haven't got a lot of choice there, you have to choose the situation you're in and make that the most you can. And she does. And then, of course, we have Martha, who is a different kind of woman. And she um, she's based on someone I know who is riven with that anger. Yeah. And it is it is different personalities thrust into unthinkable situations. Yeah, absolutely. I find that interesting that you say, you know, you'd like to be a little bit more like Lizzie. But I think... I strongly suspect that there's different parts of you that might be in all of these extraordinary characters. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that that's what makes it so powerful. That's what makes these characters so believable. They, you know, you, you, you literally start to think this, this is, they're all real. This, this is really happening right now. You are in their story. I think that's testament to what an extraordinary writer you are. Oh, thank you so much. And I feel like you've, you've probably, as I say, I strongly suspect there's a little piece of you in all of them because women, as we so know too, are very, very complex and layered. And, we have to do various things to survive. I was a single parent in the 80s for seven years, wow. nearly eight years. That was tough. And as an adopted person, I had no family. There was no and, – and I do – just returning briefly to that subject, I do need to say that I never think of it in terms of good or bad adoption. I think of it in terms of structures and functions 
that treat adoption, that uh, that uh, mean that adopted people's lives are different because of the structures that they have to live within, um, the human rights um, uh, situations that they must live with, which are different to non-adopted. But it is, you know, that those years where I was a single parent with three children um, and no support and no family member, no cousins or aunts or any of that. So learning to, having to survive through that time really did, and not just survive, but thrive and be, not just be, you know, a, a dull, depressed person, but really making the most of not having a lot. It did teach me. Yeah. Taught yeah. me how to survive and how to be not so much grateful, but accepting of these situations. And then all, at the same time, working to make change. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I'm blown away by your story. I just am. Um, I think you're extraordinary. So you're not just, you, you, yes, journalist, author, um, not just of a powerful memoir, but also of this extraordinary novel, but you're also, and you touched on this a little bit before, a filmmaker. And I'm really fascinated by that as well. So you um, have made documentaries. Tell us about that and how that came about. Um, I married a filmmaker, as you do. <laughs> as you do. <laughs> as you do. Um, at 39. And he was, he's a cinematographer. And so we wanted to make, we, you know, we liked working together for a while anyway. <laughs> and so we made, we decided we'd make a documentary and we made our, f- we made our first one about a gentleman who lived near us, who was a, um, uh, a, was into biodynamic gardening and farming. And it was a particular kind of um, organic farming. And he was going to India all the time where he was kind of treated like the new Gandhi. I'm sorry. Um, he was treated like the new Gandhi. And he, um, and he, it's just sorry. It's just, so anyway, yes. So he was treated like the new Gandhi and we followed him around India. Just one camera, just the two of us. I'm doing wow. sound. My husband's doing, Tom's doing the camera. And we made a film about that, which was really, really interesting and exciting. And the next one we made was we lived in a little farmlet just outside of town and little 10 acres. Okay. One moment. You're all right. Um, how do I stop all this? One minute. And so we lived in a little, um, this little farmlet, and we would drive into town, my daughter and I, and we would see this guy on a gorgeous stallion in the middle of summer, riding bareback along the side of the road with his hair flying, long, long hair, handsome. And we would, we would call him the Phantom. So we engineered a meeting and discovered that. There was a beautiful wife and six children, and yeah, often when he was galloping along, he'd have a small child clinging to his back. <laughs> and they were all extraordinary riders, and they really they lived a very interesting life. And so we just started filming them, um, with their permission, of course, over three years. And we would just pop in and out and film them, and we created this film called uh, This Way of Life. And it was very, um, what if I turn the sound off? If I turn this off, does it turn? Can you still hear me? I can. No. Okay. I don't know how to stop that doing that. That's okay. We'll work it out. Oh, thank you. Anyway, so we made a film about this family called This Way of Life um, that was shortlisted for an Academy Award, and we made it for like, I don't know, $60,000 from beginning to end. Again, just the two of us with a handheld camera and uh, me doing the sound when I was really no good at it. Um, And then we made another one about my husband's aunt and uncle in in England who lived in the last unrenovated house in St. John's Wood. And she was an artist and he was a scientist, brother and sister, and hated each other. So there was that as well. 
Wow. Okay. So I love how you just like glossed over this. So you get, you get, wow, shortlisted, like nominated for an Academy Award. Let's go back to that. What does that feel like? Because for most of us, let's say it, it's, it, that's just like a fantasy thing over there. No, I, I mean, you know, how many people do you actually get to meet? We, no, no, we um, we were shortlisted and that year they were only taking five documentaries in the final and we were number six. Oh, still, still. They were taking ten. <laughs> we were so, close. so close. But to be shortlisted, to be shortlisted. It was great. And then it was a huge letdown. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But I mean, but how extraordinary that, you know, you created something that yeah. really was magical Absolutely. enough that it was on the radar of the committee, you know, of the Academy yeah. um, and that, that people in the Academy watched it and were really yeah. kind of enamored by it. Clearly it was shortlisted. Yeah. Well, I think they start, I think the long list is like 30. Yeah. So shortlist is 10. I don't know now it's probably more because 10 go through um, to the, you know, 10 get nominated. But they changed the rules the year after. Of course they did. And, you know, they're prone to changing the rules all the time, I think. The Academy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that, was, that was nice. That was a good thing. Yeah. Wow. So filmmaker, writer, extraordinary. Um, you're also the mother of four daughters, is that correct? And one stepdaughter, yes. And one stepdaughter, five Five daughters, there you go, all in, <laughs> um, which is quite extraordinary. And what did they think about your writing? Because your characters very much, I mean, what I, I guess what I love as a fierce, fierce mm-hmm. feminist um, is that this beautiful novel really, to me, embodies that. Mm-hmm. There's so much feminism, powerful mm-hmm. female characters in this, in this novel. What did they think about your writing? Oh, you'd have to ask them, I think. (laughs) (laughs) I think the answer would be quite mixed, as with every family. Some like it, some don't. (laughs) (laughs) Like the um, the my memoir, some don't. (laughs) So I think uh, you know you can't please everyone, and I think as women we try to. We really want. We want to. We don't want to you know, step on our children's feelings and we don't want to do anything that um, disturbs those who are closest to us. Uh, But sometimes to be able to uh, experience your own creativity, you have to. Um, Yeah. The characters in Gallows Bird, they are all fiercely female in their approach to the world. And I've always been I've always, I think I've been a strong person. I think I've, you know, worked hard to, to stand on my, stand strongly on two feet. Um, and I hope that's what they, my kids have taken from that. Yeah, that's really great. And I think that the process, it's interesting. So I, I am extremely lucky to, uh, to have this podcast and get to speak to so many extraordinary women, a number of whom have written their own memoirs. Um, because I'm a strong believer that every woman has a story and it's really extraordinary when those stories have a vehicle where they can be told. Um, the process of writing a memoir, I would imagine, and is extremely different to writing a novel. Tell me about that and the process of, of that. I think you you dig deep in a different way. So, and I... <sighs> I do prefer, I do tend to, rather than feel my personal emotions, I tend to kind of hide behind research. So when I was writing the memoir, that I found that pretty excruciating. I know at one point I was writing a section of it, and my husband was making a film in Vancouver, so we were staying there, and I was listening to music. I had a whole thing going on where I was so traumatized by, not traumatized, but I was struggling with what I was writing and I would play music extremely loudly and get up and just dance and then turn it off and sit down and try and write the next little bit. But, you know, I sort of had to shake it out it, because it was very intense. But having done that, it was like I had exercised those ghosts and 
I found great freedom, great intellectual and emotional freedom that came from uncorking that bottle, I guess. Yeah. And healing? Do you, did you find it a healing journey or not so much? I did. Um, the work I've just completed recently has really completed that that sense of healing. So, yeah, so your memoir led you to your work, which you've just mentioned, and I'm really fascinated by that as well. So um, you've gone on and done a, a PhD. Um, tell us about that and the work that you that that you did well I'm very um I always like to say I'm late to my own party so I did not uh, I mean I was unable to go to university when I was young through a whole series of circumstances including um an injury and I um I desperately, after I wrote the memoir, I wanted more than anything to do a master's in creative writing. But I, you need an undergrad, and I didn't have one. So I applied anyway, and with the memoir as you know, proof of work and uh, a lot of other writing I'd done as a journalist and columnist, and amazingly I was accepted into the program. And my idea was right from the beginning was to get a high mark from that so that I could then get a scholarship to have the time and be able to be able to do a PhD. And it all came about. I actually managed to do those things. And so that was, an, I st- started the master's in 2020 and I've just finished the PhD now. It's just gone off to examiners. And so um, the master's, I wrote in the outline of another novel, which is hopefully coming out next year. Um, but then the PhD is about human adoption and it's about the structures and functions and purpose. So it's deeply researched. There is a lot of personal story, my own and others, but not uh, more about individual struggles with um, the structures and what that, you know, people trying to get hold of their original birth certificates or trying to have their father's names added to their birth certificates or attempting to get various, you know, pieces, trying to get adoption folios, all the information that's held on them, those kinds of things. And so that was, it was a very, I thought I understood it and knew a lot about the subject, but once I'd, the great beauty of the PhD is, you know, when you get into it, you realize it gives you the time and the permission to really dig deep. And I realized I actually didn't understand it at all, not very well at all. Yeah, right. And in doing the PhD, you, as you say, it's the stories, your story, but also the stories of, of the stories of others and their adoption journeys. Um, what was that like? I mean, I imagine that, um, you know, like everything else, everyone is individual and all those stories are unique in some ways and aligned in others. Um, what was it like to be able to, I guess, hear the stories and share the stories of others? Well, the, you're right when you say about them being aligned. So really, and because I don't write about good or bad adoption, it really wasn't about those kinds of the stories of growing up or, you know, suffering or not suffering, having a good experience or not. It was very much about exactly the the struggles of trying to gain parity with the non-adopted. Um, and I found that, I found that healing in that, ah, it's not just me that's, you know, they're not singling me out to um, uh, to treat poorly. Um, it's everyone. So, for instance, if you wish to look at your adoption file in New Zealand, you have to go to the you have to go to the family court, and you have to be able to provide stand before a judge and provide what's called a special reason for you to have access to your files and your documents. But special reason isn't defined in law, and it's up to the judge on the day. This is a nearly 70-year-old law that is unchanged. So the frustrations people have with those types of situations are really where I was coming from, plus the stories of mothers. And I have three mothers who share very um, emotionally what happened to them and how it came that their children were taken for adoption. And and the you know the structures of the time and the legislation 
around it and how legislation has grown up around this one piece of this one act. All these other associated acts have grown up around it to continue the control over adopted people's lives. Yeah, right. Um, so the journey of the PhD, and as you say, that's now been submitted. Do you feel a sense of relief or do you feel a sense of there's still so much to work to do in that space? I mean, the relief is personal, obviously, to achieve something that is that was quite grueling and difficult. The work to be done is it, there's been no change in, you know, it's nearly 70 years. So the work is still absolutely needs to be done and hasn't been done. There was, you know, a couple of years ago, there were the Ministry of Justice here put out some discussion papers about adoption law reform. And they were full of the same old rhetoric, the same narrow understanding, the lack of understanding of what adoption is and what it does. And really, it was intended as a process to creating new law to enable a new generation of people to be adopted and lose their and lose their identity and uh, their ancestors, their history, all of that wiped away. Do you think that's changing for younger generations um, who are adopted? The numbers have changed. Mm. And of course we talk, I mean, obviously we're not taking, there's over 100,000 adopted people in New Zealand. Um, and we talk a lot about open adoption, but by actually, in fact, by law, there is no open adoption. It is entirely, it's not, it's not an adopted person's right it is entirely at the um, the behest of the adopters. They get to choose how open and what that means. So there is no. It's changed. It's changed, and yet it hasn't changed. What has changed, of course, that undermines adoption is is DNA, and you you retain all of these structures, and yet you can find your family, your your you know biological family. But they are, in law, they are your social family and your socially constructed family is your legal family, which is kind of, you know, it's a bit round the wrong way in my thinking. Yeah, and I I am quite fascinated, you know, I've done, you know, my own DNA and have found uh, families and have found, you know, like I guess missing links uh, via that, via Ancestry.com. and. I, it is a fascinating journey, I think, um, that all of us want to know, you know, yeah. it's, it's human nature, I think, to want to know, well, who am I? Where did I yeah. come from? Um, I, I just think that that's just, yeah, it's a powerful force, I think, for all of us. I think it is too. I mean, but for the non-adopted, it's a hobby. For the adopted, it can be life or death. It can relate to um, medical, you know, medical history, for instance, something that adopted people are denied. So there can be a life or death component to it. Um, that is that nobody really talks about. But it is true. We all want to know that stuff. Doesn't matter who we are. They, the, the latest figures I got was that, um, DNA and putting together family trees and ancestry and what have you is the second most popular hobby in the world. So, yeah, and it's interesting that it's called a hobby because I think for um, a lot of people, if you genuinely have no idea who, you know, yes. your your biological parents are, etc., um, or biological family, and inserts the word, it, it doesn't feel much like a hobby. I, I no. imagine it feels like, as you say, it's a journey of self and a journey yes. of of where did I come from? Who am I really? Yeah, coming home to self, I think, is what it is because you are you. You are literally denied even something down to as simple as, you know, a genetic mirror, being able to look like someone um, mm -hmm. so that you can see yourself reflected as you're growing up. If you look like no one, if you have a different type of intellect, if you have a different humor, if you have a different body type, all of these are things that you may not even – consciously consider but they are they are sitting in there and they're imprinted and these have nothing to do with you know good parents or less good parents they are just simple facts of the experience 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think your work is extraordinary and no doubt the work that you've done with this PhD will be extraordinarily helpful to so many other people who are going through that journey themselves. And hopefully, you know, who knows, you, you it might actually lead a, a pathway to actually changing some of these, these yeah. uh, you know, structures that are still in place and laws that govern them. I mean, I have to say Australia is way ahead of New Zealand in that area. We've had the apology from Julia Gillard. That was extraordinary. Uh, in some states in Australia, you can apply and as a right to end your adoptive status and return to your original identity. These things are not available here. Yeah, nobody's even thought to make an apology. Yeah, yeah. And and I hope that in time that will come. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, for yourself and for everyone else, as you say, the over 100,000 people who are on that journey themselves. So um, once again, I want to say congratulations um, on The Gallows Third. It is a beautiful looking book, by the way. I love this cover art. Yeah, Pantera Press, the oh. Sydney based publishers, they've been fantastic. I want to give a shout out to Pantera Press. They've been fantastic to work with. They really have. Oh, yeah. So good to hear that, by the way. But for those who are listening along and not watching along, um, it is a beautiful cover of this. Uh, it's gorgeous. It, a beautiful birdie uh, standing on basically the cliff face in Sydney and in the background you can actually see the ship coming into the harbour. It's um, it's a powerful, beautiful book. I think, as I said, the characters jump off the page. They They are all things living and breathing, which I think is testament to you, as I said, as a writer. Um, I'm incredibly humbled that you've given up your time today to come and share your story with us. And thank you for sharing your journey so honestly with us as well. Congratulations on this book. I would say to everyone, you know, as Molly Meldrum would have said on Countdown, do yourself a favour, go out. Buy, the, buy a copy of this book and read it. And um, and I'll be putting up all the links in the show notes and across our socials as well um, where you can find um, this beautiful book but also where you can find out more about Barbara. Um, and I'll put up the links to your website as well. So oh, thank you thank so you. much for sharing your story with me today. Thank you, Sandy. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you. I've enjoyed it immensely. Oh, thank you. So have I. And I love that we are two women wearing hot pink glasses. Yeah, if I'd realised it was going to be fun, though, would have. <laughs> no, sure. <laughs> <That's so great. laughs> Thanks so much for listening along to the Good Girl Confessional podcast. I'm really thrilled and excited that the Good Girl Confessional podcast is part of the WB40 Women Beyond 40 platform, a platform we created for women 40, 50, 60 and beyond to share their hard-won wisdom and to learn more information about the things that matter to us as women, midlife and beyond. Now, wherever you're listening to this podcast, I would be hugely grateful if you can follow, like and subscribe because it helps the algorithm to actually reach more like-minded women um, and they will realize that they're not alone in their journey that's for sure you might also like to know that we're over on youtube join us there the good girl confessional we're also on instagram and facebook as both the good girl confessional and women beyond 40 and we're over on tiktok under women beyond 40 i would also like to thank the editor and producer of the podcast michael smedley as always what a brilliant person and thank you so much for listening along I love you. Thanks for your support and we'll see you soon.